Hi, my name is Dr. John Duyard and welcome to this month's podcast called Cool Your Pitta. Pitta in Ayurveda means heat. So cool your heat, particularly useful as we move into the summer months when it gets hot. And if you are a hot body type, have a hot constitution, and you're in a hot season like the summer, and you're eating hot, spicy food, eating fermented lactic acid fermented foods, which are heating. If you are working out and exercising in the hot summer sun, we tend to stack this heat in the body and can easily overheat and inflame. Let me, let me list a few conditions that you might recognize. Um, things like inflammation has the word flame in it. Heart burn, of course, has the word burn in it, which includes being way too hot. Uh, an ulcer is a relationship of too much heat. Um, uh, burned out, pushing yourself too hard. Skin rashes, a rash on your skin. Anger, rage, burning pain, a real common kind of pain that people tend to get. Fevers uh, are an accumulation of excess heat. Hay fever, a common condition at the end of the summer when the heat accumulates and dries us out and produces a bunch of reactive mucus in the form of hay fever. Fired up, uh, a hot head. All of these conditions sort of relate to a tendency of us for, for us to be overheated. I have been writing a lot recently about circadian medicine and our connection to the cycles of nature. As you know, at lifespa.com, what, what I'm constantly writing about three times a week is ancient wisdom principles proven with modern science. And I figure if something's been around for a hundred years or a thousand years and still practiced today, and we can find science to prove it, boy, we should look at that. Because science alone can prove whatever it really wants, depending on who's funding the study. But when you take ancient wisdom and put it together, it's really hard to ignore. It's something we should at least look at, right? And that's what I feel. So one of the most fundamental aspects of Ayurveda or any traditional system of medicine is the natural link to the cycles of nature. And I've written a ton about this and I'm completely fascinated by it because science shows that humans have disconnected themselves from the cycles of nature. And, and, and it's not very difficult for us to get reconnected. They took, for example, at the University of uh, Colorado here in Boulder, they took a group of healthy boulderites and then they, they checked their melatonin and cortisol levels. Melatonin levels, which is, a, which is the hormone molecule connecting us to the light dark cycles. It's a three billion year old molecule. Every primitive cell had melatonin. Every plant has melatonin. Every bug has melatonin. We have melatonin in them because if we didn't get the light dark cycle thing, we don't survive. So every species, plant, bug, everything on the planet is connected to those cycles. And the studies show that when people go and they, and they get their melatonin levels checked, they're supposed to increase at night and, and cortisol decrease it, um, you know, at the, in the evening and the melatonin increases at night. And they were completely all over the place. People were out of whack. We're stimulating ourselves with caffeine all day long. We get a glass of wine to get calmed down at night. It's sort of a mess. And the, the, the repercussions of this are powerful. So I, I was motivated by to, to do this particular podcast, one, because it's summer, two, because I'm really into circadian science. Scientific America wrote a big article saying that the future of medicine, something that will revolutionize medicine, as you know, is called circadian science. And it's all about understanding who you are, what your nature is, what is your body type? And you can take a free, really awesome, I think, body type questionnaire on our website at lifespa.com and find out who you are, how much pitta, how much fire, how much heat do you actually carry? And if you have a lot of heat in your body type, what season is going to be really important for you so you do not inflame, do not burn out, do not get heartburn or reflux or GERD, these kinds of things which tend to happen to people with a lot of heat in their body type. So knowing your body type and knowing the season that you're in and then knowing how to antidote that is what this podcast is really all about. 
And then realizing that even if you're not just a pure, hot, fiery, competitive, driven, pitta, body type, there are absolutely things that every one of us should do regardless of our body type because tis the season. In ancestral times, ancient times, people ate with the seasons regardless of their body type. So just knowing your body type doesn't mean that I just eat pitta, reducing, cooling foods for the rest of my life. doesn't make any sense to do that, right? When you think about winter time, for example, if cooling foods are fruits and vegetables and you live in Vermont in January in the year 1800, where are you going to get fruits and vegetables? They didn't exist. So when you think of Ayurveda as the science of life, it should be very easy for us to plug in any of the Ayurvedic principles into any particular time of this planet's existence, into any place on this planet, and eat and live in harmony with those natural cycles. So saying, I'm a pitta body type, and I should eat pitta pacifying food, and that's what I eat, doesn't really make any sense, because you couldn't do that in Vermont in January in the year 1800. So what is the fundamental truth of Ayurveda is that we should connect to the cycles of nature, eat with the seasons. And of course, I'm sure many of you know that we publish, I wrote a book called The Three Season Diet, which is all about eating with the seasons and nobody really read it. I mean, it, was, it did okay. But the information in it was so profound. And then when the study started coming out about circadian medicine, in one study I've said, you've probably heard me say it a, a million times, that deer literally die when they eat out of season, if they eat uh, bark in the winter, they have microbes for bark. If they eat bark in the summer, they've got the wrong microbes. And as a result, they could cause, it could cause a level of indigestion. It could literally kill the deer. And that is something that blew my mind, that deer could die when they eat out of season. And what do we do? So I took the information from my three season diet book, which are grocery lists for winter, for summer and spring called the three season diet. To answer your question, which I know is coming, there are four seasons, but in nature, one season is dormant. One season takes a rest. So we have a spring harvest, a summer harvest, and a fall harvest for winter eating, and one season takes rest. So there's three primary growing seasons from which we eat from. Thus, the three season diet. So I took that, and I, I, I worked with Emma Frisch from the Food Network, a phenomenal chef from Ithaca, New York, and she took our grocery list and took them and we made season monthly recipes for every month of the year. And, and then I put together a monthly grocery list and superfood list for January, February, March, July, April, all the seasons. And, found, and, and, we, and we published them for free. It's called the Three Season Diet Challenge. And you'll get a link. You can find a link here on your homepage here or the page you're looking at it's to get that for free. It's on my website, on my homepage as well, lifespa.com for free. It's called the Three Season Diet Challenge. You definitely want to, if whether you look at it or use it or not, it's just going to come in for free. And then it'll give you some guys some recipes to try for the month of July and August and se September. And in the summer months, we have a special thing that we do. We publish the, the an edible flower guide where you get all the flowers that are in the harvested are in July that are that are blooming in July and August, September, and June throughout the entire spring and summer and what are what are the what flowers are edible and what they do medicinally and how to eat them. So it's pretty cool. So don't miss that, right? So that sort of blew my mind that 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 these that and the studies that I've written about are that the microbes in the soil change dramatically from one season to the next season to the next season. So in the summertime, there are different microbes to digest seasonal foods. So we should eat the foods that are in season to get the mug bugs from the soil to the food to our mouth to our gut to change our microbiome, to send a message to our brain. We're having these really cool bugs. It's summer. We're chilling out. We're dissipating heat way better. Good things are happening. So we should be thinking about seasonal eating, of course, as a fundamental principle for balancing and cooling off your pitta, right? Then, once you do that, you overlay on top of that the, your individual body type and nature. How do, how do you do that? Well, you take the quiz, find out what you are. If you have a lot of heat, then summer becomes an opportunity for you to really make sure you do not overheat. And I'm gonna to talk to you in detail today in this podcast about what happens if we screw that up and we don't do that, okay? If you're a winter, vata, cold, dry body type, 
then summer warms you up, makes you feel really good. Most people with a lot of vata or winter qualities, they feel really good in the summer, but yes, still have to eat summer reducing foods. Okay, that's important. If you're a kapha, spring, wet, congestive, gain, hold on to more water kind of body type that happens in the spring, then the summer months, which are very, very uh, hot, um, can be effective to help kind of help you balance some of that extra mucus. Because after spring, you get summer, and the summer sort of dries things up for you and makes you feel a little better. So I hope that makes more sense. And I want to kind of dig in here into the details, but that's sort of an overview. I was completely inspired to do this podcast because of the Ayurveda 101 course that I recently finished with uh, in, in conjunction with Yoga Journal and the Kripalu uh, Yoga Center out in Massachusetts. Um, one of the Kripalu Yoga teachers, uh, Larissa Carlson, and I did a, a, a whole Ayurveda 101 course, 101 course based on the seasons. It's never been done before. It's, I, I think, uh, you know, something that I've been dreaming about since I wrote my three season diet book to actually put together a course that teaches you yoga, breathing, pranayama, meditation, Ayurvedic lifestyle, diet, exercise, routine for each season. So we have a spring package, a summer package, and a, and a, uh, and a winter package that you can get. And you can buy them individually or you can buy them all at once. You get a super huge discount. You save over $400 if you buy them all at once. Um, and um, you get uh, a small discount if you get it now because the summer one it launches, just launched on July 6th. So you can get the summer packet right now as you speak. So anyway, that's something that I think is just really, really valuable because of this really important connection to the natural cycles of nature called circadian medicine that we've all sort of lost. Now, in the springtime, it's wet and rainy and muddy and congested. And I've talked a lot about how the spring so leafy greens and sprouts and berries and things like that are clean and scrub the intestinal villi. Then summer comes along, and if you don't do the spring cleaning thing, the summer will sort of bake all that extra boggy mucus in your respiratory tract and intestinal tract and bake it into your intestinal wall called hardened mucoid material. And uh, this doesn't do wonders for the quality of your intestinal skin makes it dry and fragile and very vulnerable to irritation, inflammation, and breakdown. Your intestinal skin is your protective barrier from the outside world, right? Uh, you start out with an intestinal skin surface area as big as a, a tennis court, but as we age, we, we irritate, inflame the intestinal skin and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller until maybe it becomes the size of a racquetball court or something like that. This is the fundamental key to our health and longevity. No question about it, is the quality and integrity of your intestinal skin. And this is something that I write about. My, my entire new book called Eat Wheat is all about that because wheat, when it's not digested completely, will be too big of a molecule to get into the blood. It'll enter into the collecting ducts of your lymph, which line your intestinal tract, and cause lymphy symptoms. And lymphy symptoms are all the stuff that people get when they eat wheat, which they don't like, which is heaviness and bloat and extra weight and brain fog and tiredness and skin rashes. These are all lymphatic symptoms. And if you can help seal up your intestinal skin, decongest your lymphatic system and turn your digestive system back on, you're in business. And you can go back to eating and breaking bread again as long as you source really good, healthy, non-processed bread. So that's a really important thing. So, so in the summertime, it gets hot. And there's, thing, there's this thing called thermal accumulation. At the, as we go through the summer months, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. And as a result, at the end of the summer, it's super hot. One of the Ayurvedic principles, which I think you should all know, is that there are cycles, right? There's daily cycles, there's morning, when you wake up, we should be exercising. It's the kapha cycle, spring cycle. Every cycle starts with spring. Then the middle of the day, we eat the fired up digestive system. In the afternoon, believe it or not, it's more air and more vata based. And we should think at that time, not go to sleep, take a nap and crave Starbucks. 
So that's sort of how out of whack we are. Yeah, there's, there's life cycles. Kids start out in the springtime of their life. They make mucus for a living and they're, they're, they, they're elastic and they grow like crazy. Then we go from 18 or so up to 60. This is the fire of summertime of our life. And at the end of that summer life cycle, you will accumulate the most amount of pitta, the most amount of heat, the most vulnerable to inflammation and heartburn and GERD. These kinds of conditions, prostate inflammation, happens around that time of the life. You think about when do people begin to break down with inflammatory type conditions? Well, prostate problems in their 50s or 60s, heartburn, 50s or 60s, although nowadays people are getting it way younger, which is not right. We're out of whack. Um, inflammatory things generally tend to happen at the end of the pitta cycle, and that's a problem. Now, you can get out of whack anytime if you screw things up and don't live in sync with the natural cycle. So, so that's something we have to, we have to understand. But the, but the general theme is there's a vulnerability at the end of each cycle for the accumulation of that quality of nature. At the end of the winter, we accumulate cold and dry. And that can predispose us to dry mucous membranes in our respiratory tract. And we can produce a bunch of mucus as a result of that dryness, which is a breeding ground for colds and flus, and we get a cold and flu. At the end of the summer, we can get overheated, inflamed. Hay fever, we talked about before. What is hay fever? The hay is the irritation from all the pollens and all the grasses that are being harvested. There's a huge nectar pollen surge at that time. It irritates the respiratory mucosa, produces extra mucus, and the extra mucus is reactive to the dryness as, uh, as the summer heat dries you out, but it's also reactive to the pollens and pollutants and then the, then, and that's, and the fever is the heat and the hay is the excess mucus that's produced as a result of that. So at the end of the summer, there's going to be an accumulation of heat that can dry you out. And this is important to know because at the, summer is a hot and dry season. And if you take a lot of hot and a lot of dry, you got a desert. And the nice thing about the hot and dry season is nature was like, I got this covered. All you really have to do is eat what I harvest for you and you'll be good. Easier said than done, right? So nature says, it's hot, I get it. We're gonna give you fruits and vegetables to cool things down. No problem, you're in good shape. Except that we like fruits and vegetables in the summer, most people love more salads and fruit salads and things like that in the summer for sure. But we also like beer and wine and pasta salad and potato salad and barbecue ribs and barbecue everything. And these all of a sudden are harder for us to digest. If you think about when is the digestive system stronger and when is it weaker, it's an interesting question, right? The digestive system is stronger in the winter. In order for us to digest hard to digest foods that are more dense, that help us insulate ourselves in the winter months and store a source of energy and fuel. So the nuts and the seeds and the grains and the wheat and the legumes uh, and the tubers, they are all generally heavier and more dense and they need a lot more cooking inside of us to break them down and digest them. So there's enzymes like amylase, which is a starch digesting enzyme that increases in your body as we speak every fall and winter. And it decreases every spring and summer, suggesting that if we're gonna eat wheat, we should probably eat it when we have the enzymes to digest it. A deficiency in amylase is linked to Baker's asthma, which people who don't have that enzyme, they have an allergy to wheat. So we know that the science shows that, that amylase is increasing in the fall and the winter. So these starchy things like like root vegetables and starchy tubers and, and nuts and seeds and grains and, and things like that are very, and legumes and beans are very starchy and therefore we should have them in the fall. Now, at the end of the summertime, there is also a lot of fruits and vegetables. And so at the end of the summer, when the heat begins to accumulate, nature feels, I got this covered. 
You're going to give you fruits and vegetables to cool you all summer long. We're going to give you some super fruits and vegetables at the end of summer to deal with that thermal accumulation thing where it gets hotter at the end of the summer than it is in the beginning of the summer. It's like pomegranates, super cooling foods, watermelons, super cooling foods. All your fruits and vegetables for sure if they're ripe are going to be cooling. And then the big one of all, apples. Apples are loaded with pectin. They're super cooling. They have these enz enzymes in the skin that lower blood sugar. So when you eat the entire apple, everything, it actually has a blood sugar lowering effect. And it's super cooling. And we know one really important thing that at the end of the summer, we accumulate heat. And nature's saying, I'm trying to keep you cool all summer long. But at the end of summer, I want to dissipate the heat. So what do we do is we, we have these super cooling foods. So if you go to the Northeast or the Northwest where they grow a ton of apples like Washington, New England, you'll see that, that um, they harvest a lot of apples. And everybody in October and September, they walk around New England with loose bowel movements from eating so much apple cider, apple sauce, apple juice, apple wine, apple pie, apple butter, everything, apples, apples, apples and all that extra apple pectin and fiber causes a looser stool. And in the body, a looser stool is the body's natural way to dissipate heat out of the body. For example, if you were a little baby or your kid got a fever, they're also usually going to get loose bowel movements or diarrhea, and the diarrhea is the body's way of getting rid of the heat. That's what a looser stool will do. So a lot of people with a lot of pitta, a lot of fire, they tend to, as they get older, towards the end of their life cycle of pitta, 40s, 50s, and 60s, they begin to go from constipation or normal bowel movements to looser bowel movements because they're trying, because they're accumulating all that extra heat and the body's way of getting rid of it is to create a looser stool just like your baby did when they got a fever, they got a looser stool. So that's what happens. Now, the summertime is when the digestive system is actually not as strong because the body doesn't want to increase the amount of heat that it has. That would be crazy, right? So, so I'm eating foods that are winter foods that in the summertime, when for millions of years we've been eating foods that are in season, that have the right bugs in them, that we have the right enzymes to digest, that, either, that are either boost immunity in the winter, decongest us in the spring, or dissipate heat in the summer. So the body is sort of, we've evolved to be really good, which is why we're here and the Neanderthals aren't, because we figured out a way to dissipate heat better. By staying in Africa longer, we figured that out. And one of the ways we did that was to be able to uh, have less digestive heat in the summer. The foods are all cooked on the vine all summer long. And when you eat those fruits, they're cooked for you already. You don't need to cook them, they're cooked. When you eat those vegetables, they're cooked for you. You don't need to really cook them. Steaming them so they turn sort of that fluorescent green color makes them even easier to digest to get the cellulose to break down and get the nutrients out of them but you don't need to cook them as much in the summertime as you would in the winter when you want a little help from fire and cooking kinds of things. So it is harder for us to digest things in the summer and at the end of the summer even more difficult, but as we get into sorting to October, we, the, the digestive strength starts to amp up again. So it's we transition, which is kind of cool. So if you're eating barbecue and all these spicy foods, uh, that are increasing heat and they're very and heavy dense meats that are hard to digest and cook and wine which is fermented anytime you ferment something it goes from cooling to heating do you understand that so take a grape for example it's cooling and then you ferment it and it becomes a wine which is now got it's very acidic and it therefore has become heating Take milk, for example, which is extremely cooling when you take it out of the cow, but when you culture it into yogurt or cheese, it becomes heating, if that makes sense, which is why traditionally they made their cheese at the end of the summer months in fall to, to store all the cheese or the milk, for that matter, as cheese for winter eating. Does that make sense? Cows give their babies, have their babies in the springtime 
and then the mommy is nursing the calf all spring and summer long and at the end of the summer this cow is ready now to endure a winter on their own the milk is still coming the farmers take some of that milk they make skim off the milk make butter uh, and, and ghee out of the fat and they make cheese out of the skim that fermentation process that culturing process heats up creates an a lactic acid fermentation and that acid fermentation will heat the body up thus making fermented foods something to consider in the summertime the history of fermented foods was to preserve vegetables for a long winter the famine of winter so you would soak vegetables and you would have them be fermented again using lactic acid fermentation and these vegetables had a lot of acidity to them which would be great in the winter because it's hot and it's very you want something acidic to heat you up but in the summer a hot person in a hot season eating spicy food and fermented foods in cheese and wine and beer and coffee caffeine is very heating as well and all of a sudden we stacked a whole bunch of heat in the body I remember once I had a patient of mine who was one of the top triathletes in the world always competed really really well in cold weather races and uh, never really did well in the hot weather races and back then the world championships were in the Hawaiian Ironman and in Nice France and uh, he never did well in either the Ironman Hawaii and never did well in Nice France because they're both really hot races and they're usually done in the hot part of the year either September or August or July so it was very very hot and he never did well but he did one race an Ironman race and it was in Calgary it's called the world's toughest Ironman and he finished by hour ahead of anybody else he just blew everybody away there was it snowed during the the, the bike ride um, water was freezing cold and he couldn't understand why why anybody had difficulty clearly he was a what a very pitta body type and he loved cold weather and he had excelled in cold weather and loved it okay but you put him in a hot situation and he didn't fare as well so he came to me and we did a body type questionnaire with him and I again invite you to take our body type questionnaire and he was predominantly pitta fire and uh, and then when I got into understanding his lifestyle his favorite pre-race meal was hot spicy Mexican food so he's taking before the really really hot race a really really hot spicy Mexican meal that's only going to start to accumulate the heat his favorite uh, he loved to drink coffee which is extremely acidic and heats the body up he loved beer um, um, which is fine but when you start to stack all these things a hot body type being extremely competitive in a hot season in a hot competitive race swimming biking and running eat loving hot spicy Mexican food loving coffee very very acidic and other hot spicy foods he clearly had his pitta overheated so I then said to him I said well if you can take in your water bottle and mix up some coriander seeds and make like a coriander tea coriander um, is a really amazing seed and if you soak it like a sun tea it can be really really cooling for you and make this coriander seed sun tea and put it in your water bottle instead of drinking water do this tea and um, gave him some other pitta pacifying strategies we'll talk more about um, avoid spicy food all those hot spicy things we talked about training at the right time of day and things like that so um, and he took that advice and, and went off on his way and won the Iron Man which I thought was really amazing and um, which he always wanted to do which is super awesome and um, there were a lot of um, people suggesting accusing him of uh, taking steroids and that was why he won the Ironman that he couldn't do it otherwise because he had never done it before but he had run won so many other races that he just blew people away clearly one of the best triathletes of all time um, yet he had a hard time in the hot weather so a lot of people thought it was a steroids but I'm quite convinced that it was the coriander tea that he drank during the race that had him helped him win the Ironman anyway point being 
Don't stack stuff, right? Don't take your hot body type and stack, 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 stack. So you want to be aware of that. So be very aware. And that's where we're going to do these sort of pitta, uh, these pot, seasonal podcasts, pitta podcasts, uh, kapha podcasts uh, in the spring and a, and a vata podcast in the winter to give you the, kind of this sort of focus in on each body type. So at the end of the year, you'll have it all figured out, right? So that'll be... Um, uh, very, very helpful. So some of the things to think about that you want to, that are easy tips for you to know whether something is hot for you are the tastes that it has. If something is pungent, spicy, therefore, it's going to heat you up. Therefore, in the summer, if you have an issue with pitta, you want to reduce, you don't have to avoid completely, but you want to reduce the amount of spicy, pungent foods you eat like ginger and spicy hot Mexican food and all that spicy sauce you put on. That's not going to really, peppers, things like that, not really in your best interest. Salty foods, salt, if you throw salt on snow, it melts it, right? So therefore, not the best thing to have when you're trying to cool your pitta. Sour foods also very, uh, so sweet, so, so pungent, sour, and salty foods, all of them heat the body up. And I think understanding those, if your pitta are really important, but I'm a bigger fan, much bigger fan of thinking about what you should eat more of. And those happen to be seasonal foods. You get the three season diet grocery list, look at the, the July sub packet, eat off that list, you're gonna be golden. But there are three tastes that, are, that are, are also there to help you sort of troubleshoot some foods you're not sure about, are sweet, bitter, and astringent. So those are the three tastes that you should be thinking about trying to get more of during these hot summer months. Sweet, bitter, and astringent. So what does that mean? Sweet foods, all the fruits, right, are sweet for you, which are really good. Bitter foods, bitter leafy green vegetables, your spinach, your chard, your um, kale, all of these bitter leafy greens are all very, very cooling in nature for you. And then um, and then uh, the astringent foods, and astringent foods like a pomegranate. Think of a pomegranate that's sort of like, sort of astringent. A cucumber, sort of astringent. Some beans can be very astringent. Things that if you put them in water, they <clears throat> suck up, soak up a lot of water, like a bean would. They are also very astringent and can be very cooling for you as well. So sweet, bitter, and astringent are very important. And foods that are colder, which is, are more cool uh, as opposed to hot are going to be a little bit better for you in the summer food. And very hot, hot foods um, are things you want to avoid. So one of the classic Ayurvedic techniques to drink a lot of hot water, uh, sipping hot water, great technique, but not maybe the best technique for you during the summer months, if that makes any sense. So always think of the pitta season as the late spring all the way through summer, uh, all the way through till October. So it's June, July, uh, August, and September are the, the, the four months of summer that you have to be more aware of. As we move into October, we have that sort of that thermal accumulation where the leaves take all that, the trees take all that heat. The heat rises in the trees pushes that heat into the leaves, dries out the leaves into this pretty beautiful color, and then you have um, the dried out beautiful leaves that fall. See, we don't have leaves that fall. Our skin may dry off and flake, but we have to internally dissipate the heat, and that's why and we do that with our diet, which is why in Ayurveda, we use, um, uh, they put together cleanses like with ghee, uh, which is a very cooling oil to take internally to help heal and repair and de-inflame the intestinal skin. There are microbes inside of your gut called Clostridium butyricum, for one example, that literally makes butyric acid. That's what it does. And butyric acid is a fatty acid that heals and repairs your intestinal lining, feeds the microbiome, it's the energy for every cell in your intestinal tract, boosts your gut immunity, which makes up 80% of the immune system in your body, helps your body burn fat, particularly gut fat, belly fat. This stuff is like phenomenal. Well, ghee, which is clarified butter, all well, the milk solids are boiled off, ghee is extremely cooling as an oil, 
because it hasn't been fermented, it's just been heated in all the milk solids, which are heavier, and the proteins, which are heavier, which require more heat to digest. It's just the oil, which is extremely cooling, and therefore very, very beneficial in the summertime to put in your, on your food, uh, to even take a teaspoon with your meals throughout the day, and even to massage on your skin, very, very effective for supporting your skin. Um, and uh, so that's an oil that is really beneficial. And a little bit of oil is actually very beneficial for the pitta as well, okay? And what the oil tends to do in your digestive system is it tends to increase the bile flow. And the bile gobbles up all that oil. And the bile helps you poop. No bile, no poop. So when you take foods in the summer that have a little bit on the more oily side, and they're harvested generally towards the end of the summer, like the, the nuts and the seeds and the heavier, more dense foods have more oils in them. Those oils increase bile flow. Bile helps everything go down as opposed to up. So if you follow me, eating fatty foods increases bile, and bile helps you make more, the more bile you make, the better you eliminate. Helps you move waste out too much. If you get too much heat in there, you can produce excess bile and that can give you a looser stool or the heat can just inflame you and that can cause reactive mucus and that can cause a looser stool. But a little bit of oil like ghee and coconut oil, coconut oil may be one of the most cooling oils on the planet, has a lot of um, a lauric acid in it which converts to monolaurin and as an antiseptic there's nothing like, nothing like coconut oil a teaspoon of coconut or ghee, coconut oil or ghee with your food or in your tea is very, very effective to help keep the body cool during the summer months. And particularly in the summer, there's a lot of explosion of microbes and flowers and plants and there's just bugs everywhere, right? Um, so having something that's naturally antiseptic like the coconut oil is extremely good for the quality, integrity, health of your intestinal skin, but also to knock out any bad bugs that want to proliferate. So it's always about making sure that you keep the intestinal skin healthy and create an environment for the intestinal skin to be healthy. And it's sort of like the three little bears. It can't be too dry or vata, it can't be too wet or kapha, it has to be just right. It can't be too mucousy, it can't be too dry or constipated, it can't be too loose or constipated, it has to be just right. And some of these techniques that we use during the summer months are very important because if you get dried out in the summer, because remember summer season is hot and dry. So, if, so nature's saying eat cooling fruits and cooling vegetables and here are some of these oils which are really good for you to cool things down um, to make sure that we lubricate and slime up your intestinal tract. Doing coconut oil massage on your skin on Abhyanga also really good and when you get coconut oil you want to make sure you get the best coconut oil which includes to make sure it's it's uh, it's uh, non um, all coconut is non-gmo but organic and uh, pressed without heat cold pressed and whenever you heat up an oil you screw it up uh, it, go, it becomes denatured very very fast or it goes rancid very very fast and also make sure it's been pressed very quickly after it's been harvested. Most coconuts sit on a boat for days and days or weeks before they're pressed and by that time much of their medicinal value has been compromised. So getting good quality and it should smell like a bouquet of coconut, like amazing, right? So that's what you're looking for. So those are some important things. Herbs that I love, love, love and I have more pitta in my constitution so I take these all the time. One of them is neem. Uh, neem is an herb that is super cooling for the uh, for the whole body, for the blood, for the, and repairing for the intestinal skin. In India, they call it the queen of the skin, or, or in other parts of India, they call it the village pharmacy, because anybody comes in with anything, they give them neem and they get better, because it had that many uh, properties to it. Um, the, the neem is something that's a leaf, and it's harvested from the early spring to the late summer. So it is, and, and they would brush their teeth with it, grind it up, eat it, and what it does, it's a sort of Ayurveda's natural probiotic and, and sort of antibiotic. So what it does, is it, it antidotes any bad microbes from trying to take hold inside your intestinal tract. 
So it's an antidote for bad microbes trying to infiltrate. It repairs and heals your intestinal skin and heals that and also cools you down. I don't know what gets better than that. I, we do have colonizing probiotics that I carry and I sell and I use them to repopulate the gut, but I'm not a big fan of probiotics for the rest of your life. I'm not a big fan of anything for the rest of your life. If you know what we talk about here at LifeSpa.com, not only is it ancient wisdom, modern science, but it's also don't become dependent on another pillar of powder. Get on, get better, get off. Let's fix the problem, get back to eating foods. And if you don't, can't get those foods as well as you'd like, well then take a supplement, which is like neem's hard to get and so good. And most of it have inflamed intestinal skin anyway. So taking a supplement of neem to me is like medicine for you. It's just stuff is like phenomenal. Here in Colorado, we have an ash uh, beetle that's killing all the ash trees. And you know what they inject in the tree to, to help get rid of the ash beetle? Neem, they have other ones too, but neem is like the one that works the best, which is so cool. So such a natural antiseptic that doesn't kill the tree or hurt the tree. I um, um, wonder if the leaves start morphing into neem leaves. Um, so anyway, neem, phenomenal for you to take during the summer months, particularly if you have a tendency towards these inflammatory conditions that I mentioned in the very beginning. My other favorite one is amalaki. Amalaki is a berry or a fruit harvested sort of towards the end of the summer. So it's one of those super cooling ones, right? To really cool you down at the end of the summer, which is really important. So amalaki, and amalaki has been shown in so many studies to scrub your arteries um, to uh, help support and repair the intestinal skin. Um, it is also very, very cooling, one of the most powerful antioxidant agents. Lots, it's the one with the most, more vitamin C in it, like I think 10 times more vitamin C than an orange has. So lots of vitamin C, but what the, what the study shows, the vitamin C in the amala berry does, is it amps up and activates the antioxidants to give it this super antioxidant potential, a very, very cool uh, herb to take throughout the summer months as well. And then my other one that I love and I take uh, for summer uh, repair is an herb called Brahmi, Centella Asiatica. Uh, Centella Asiatica is an herb that is super cooling for the brain. Think about cooling your brain so you're not yelling, screaming, you know, throwing pots and pans. And sometimes pitta fires you up, irritates you, anger, angers you, and next thing you know, you're, you're doing things you, you, you regret. Well, the, the Brahmi, it cools down your pitta. It's also been shown to be extremely beneficial for the skin on the intestinal tract, for for, for heartburn-related, skin-related conditions on the inside. It's also been shown to be incredibly good for the skin. We have Brahmi in our skincare products, and they're very popular now uh, in many skincare products that are being developed because it's so good for the skin. And then the best thing about Brahmi, Centella Asiatica, is it's been also shown in studies, I've written all about this in my, my newsletters, you can get them, and, Please make sure you sign up for my newsletters, which are, uh, we come out three times a week, all about free information about proving ancient wisdom, modern science. I, I, I think the information is so valuable. So anyway, Brahmi was in one of those herbs that showed to be a powerful agent for the lymphatic system, particularly the micro lymphatic systems, the micro circulatory channels. And they discovered about three years ago, these lymphatics in the brain that drain three pounds of toxic chemicals and plaque out of your brain every year while you sleep at night. And Brahmi, one of the very best herbs to help people sleep at night, particularly in the, in the 10 o'clock to two time when people have a hard time getting settled down, too much heat in the body towards midnight, you have too much, between 10 o'clock and two, that's when the heat accumulates at night. It's when the liver becomes activated to detoxify you. It's the peak of melatonin time, when we should be sleeping deeply, when melatonin scrubs and cleans like a janitor, the floors and the windows and protects you, it adds years to your life. And if you don't get that sleep, you don't produce the melatonin. And if you don't get uh, that uh, melatonin or that sleep, you don't drain the lymphatic vessels and the toxins out of your brain and toxins or congestion in those brain lymphs, which are due to inflammation, again, are linked to inflammation, infection, both heat-related conditions, autoimmune conditions, uh, mood-related concerns, and, um, and cognitive decline. So really important uh, herb as well for the brain, for mental clarity, to have, take it before you go to bed, to sleep, take it before you go to bed, so you get the brain to drain really well, 
really powerful, and then to repair and heal the heat, accumulated heat inside the intestinal skin. Perhaps the biggest cause of pitta-related concerns in the body is due to something Ayurveda calls um, something Ayurveda calls upward moving vata or udvartana. And the word udvartana means upward moving vata, which means everything is going up instead of down. One of the most common conditions we have today in our culture is a condition called gastroparesis, which is where the stomach holds on to the food too long, holds on to the acid too long, and therefore heats up and irritates the stomach lining and causes GERD and heartburn related issues, things like that. Um, and it's caused by gastroparesis. Ayurveda talked about that thousands of years ago and talked about it as upward moving vata. So if you think about vata as the air, and the air or the vata is seated in your intestinal tract and it's supposed to go down for pooping and elimination and reproduction, all that goes down, right? We have our babies that way. Um, if there is a problem with the going down part, people have constipation, looser stools, mucus in the stools, menstrual concerns, bloating in their belly, extra weight around their belly or their hips. It's congested down there and boggy down there. So instead of everything going down, the toxins from the intestinal tract that can't get out well, remember the intestinal skin is like the three little bears, can't be too dry, can't be too wet, it's gotta be just right. If it isn't just right, it inflames, irritates, and then you can't get the stuff out as well as it could. It defaults back to your liver. This is called the enteric cycle. And it's now going up. It's called Udvartana, upward moving vata. You have a wind now blowing on the fire. And when the wind blows on the fire, you got a forest fire, extra heat building up, blowing in the upper respiratory tract, drying out your sinuses, causing respiratory irritation, reactive mucus, hay fever. When do you get that? End of summer, when the heat's accumulated, you start stacking, end of summer heat pollens and allergens and pollutants that maybe are more uh, abundant at the end of the summer. A lot of hot spicy food that you may have stacked during this time. And then you have upper moving vata, maybe because you're super stressed out, you're doing 90 things a day and working really hard. And that means all this energy up here, everything goes north to help out, wind blows on a fire, wind on a fire, creates more heat coming up, dries you out, burns you out. Now you can't sleep at night. Your cortisol levels, your stress fighting hormones start to increase during the day and they stay increased into the night. You can't settle down or sleep. So we have to now dig you out of that relationship, which is also creating too much heat and too much inflammation. That's what extra cortisol does to the body. It causes inflammation and irritation. Just like if you took someone took steroids too much, they would give them all this energy to fight the stress. But if it was there for too long, it would break them down uh, too much because it's degenerative. It's a degenerative inflammatory hormone. So interesting, right? It all sort of, be, I hope you're following me on this because I know it's a lot to handle, but I think it's a, a fascinating discussion about how pitta happens. And what happens with this upward moving vata thing, not only does it cause heartburn related issues, dry throats, sore throats, thyroid congestion, lymphatic congestion in the brain, heat-related issues of skin rashes and rosacea and things like that in your head and neck, hay fever, mucus, colds, flus, all this up, 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 wind blowing on a fire. We got to put that fire out. Well, when it leaves your intestinal tract and goes to your liver, your liver's going like, wait a minute, I just dumped all those toxins into the intestinal tract. What the heck are they doing back here? Liver gets congested, the bile in the liver starts to get thick, and the bile in the liver gets thick. You have a heat-related issue because you can't make enough bile. Think of bile like a Pac-Man gobbling up toxins and fats and things. Take that bile into your intestinal tract to take everything down. If you don't have enough bile, you don't have that downward force. Everything goes up. You have upward moving vata, which means sort of a form of gastroparesis. So stay with me here. I'm going to wrap this up here in a minute. Let's say your liver is congested. And for most of us, it is because We've been eating processed foods for 60 years. When they took cholesterol out of our diet, they replaced that, those good fats like ghee and coconut oil and butter with vegetable oils and to make seed, and they're all from seeds, right? 
So to make those seed oils, most of them are, from seeds, to make those seeds oils stable, they had to bleach, boil, and deodorize and render them completely unappetizing to anybody, including all the microbes. So they became preservatives. I'm like, well, this is great. These polyunsaturated fatty acids, we could stick them into a loaf of bread, and the bread will stay squishy for a month. Wonder bread. And a lot of bread we eat today, even organic, you, need, you can have organic bread with all that stuff, still stay squishy on the shelf for a month. Put it in a packaged food, stuff lasts forever. It extends shelf life, but not your life. Those oils, your, the microbes won't touch it. That's why the bread stays squishy. They don't want it. You put it inside your gut, the, my, our microbes don't want it, don't know what to do with it. That oil ends up right back to the garbage center, your liver, congest your liver and your bile. The number one abdominal surgery in America today is gallbladder surgery. Levels are going up and up and up like crazy, right? So as a result of that, we don't produce as much bile. The bile has become thick and viscous. viscous. It's a medical term called bile sludge, which is why I wrote the ebook called Safe Liver Cleansing Ebook. If you haven't read it, you really should, particularly if you've heard about or read about the liver flushes or bile flushes that are extremely popular today. I've been doing those liver flushes for 30 years. We, I learned that in chiropractic school in 1982. No, 80. Yeah, 82, I was in school from 80 to 84. And, and I learned about it during then, it took a long time, right? Um, and when I got into practice and I would use it, it became very clear that this was not a cleanse for anybody anytime, that it needed to be something that people would do when they were ready and they needed it and they could handle it. And I have watched so many cleansing liver flush, bile flush casualties come into my office. Yes, tons of miracles too, but a lot of people didn't fare very, very well. So I never wrote that article for all these years on my website to just put it out there for anybody to do. But when it got so popular, I decided to write a safe liver enzyme cleansing ebook, which gives you the protocol to flush out, clean, repair, reboot liver gallbladder function first, the best you could. And if you can make it through all these prerequisite tests, then you can, if you even need to by that time, do the actual liver flush. But most of my patients don't actually need to do the liver flush because the preparatory steps, which takes about a month, that do that are right there and it's all for free on the ebook. It's called the Safe Liver Cleansing ebook. It's right on my website um, in the ebook section in the Learn tab. And you can get that information for free. And that is how you get the downward. And that's why people feel so good when they have the miracles with the bile flush is you're getting this huge downward movement thing, reversing the upward moving vata udvartana gastroparesis effect. So stay with me. You don't make as much bile as you used to because of all the congested foods and the eliminative concerns. The bile gets thick. Bile also doesn't just make you poop. It's a buffer for the acid in your stomach. If the bile is congested and you eat a ham sandwich, you need a certain amount of bile to buffer the acid that's required to cook the ham sandwich, for example, right? If the liver doesn't kick in and make that bile, you're going to hold on to that ham sandwich and all the acid and all the fats and everything else in your stomach for as long as you can, waiting for the bile to kick in. If that light never turns green and the bile never kicks in, you're going to hold on to that acid and it's going to start to burn and irritate and go up and creating more upward moving vata. Things like GERD and hyalurhernias, things like that, are as a result of that. I've written a ton of articles, one called Stomach Pulling uh, Techniques and, and many articles on heartburn to, to help you navigate around that condition. But the kingpin of that, and I write about that in detail in my Eat Wheat book as well, the kingpin is getting your liver and your gallbladder to move out. So some of the foods that are very cooling and helpful to get your liver and your gallbladder to flush are what are called cholagogs. Cholagogs are bile movers, and if you can get the bile to go down and make a lot of it, you just took the wind away from the fire and solved the problem. So we get to solve it from the cause versus just trying to give you an anti-acid for the condition there and some kind of drug for the intestinal skin to take the inflammation out there and then take all these foods out of your digestive, out of your diet, like wheat and dairy, which are completely not bad foods, but I do get that when you eat them, you don't feel wonderful. But if you can navigate around the processed versions, eat whole versions of that, reboot your digestive system, get the, the heat to go down instead of up, most people, other than the people who are celiac, which is just 1% of the population, find themselves being able to break bread again and eat wheat. So, so here are some of the cholagogues that, um, 
And what I love to start in the summertime, start your day with um, a juice of celery, apple, and beets. And that juice is wonderful to start your day with. Other cholagogues of fenugreek tea uh, increases the contractibility of your gallbladder by 75%. Turmeric increases the contractibility of your gallbladder by 50%. Artichokes, phenomenal for contracting and decongesting the bile sludge inside your liver. Uh, ginger, another really cool cholagog. Don't overdo it because it's a little on the spice side, but in small amounts can be very, very cooling for you as well. So those are some of the things that you can do to help make sure that the, the real fundamental cause of this pitta is this upward moving vata, which is very important. And then you got to think about pitta body type, who they are, fiery, driven, competitive, focused people. And, you know, you got to think about, um, of course, you know, not exercising in the hot weather, not getting overheated, not skipping meals. Pitta people have a lot of fire. They need to eat food. If you don't feed the pitta body type in the middle of the day when the digestion is stronger, some studies, circadian science shows that the digestive fire is in fact stronger in the middle of the day. That's when most people around the world and historically have always eaten their biggest meal in the middle of the day, and that's when we should do it too. That's what, uh, that this is the pitta time of the day, so we should be eating in a relaxed way. So pitta body types really need to make sure that happens. And also rest. A lot of pitta body types start getting a second wind at 10 o'clock and wire it up till 2 o'clock, changing the world. This is dangerous. Um, you have to realize that at 8 o'clock, cortisol levels are coming down. Melatonin levels are starting to come up. And if you don't ride that wave, you can get away with it for a while. But what happens is the ability for your cortisol to go all the way down and your melatonin levels to go all the way up starts to become lethargic as you age. And melatonin is not just a, a hormone to get you to sleep. It gets you to sleep so it can do its job, which is the most powerful detoxifying hormone in the body. It's the janitor that does floors and windows and scrubs every cell of your body linked to when you have lack of it, and we do produce less of it as we age, linked to um, all types of inflammatory pitta-related conditions, uh, breast cancers, prostate concerns, microbiome issues, osteoporosis. It's really important. It's the, the, it's the light, dark cycle hormone, billions of years old, and it regulates at least 12 different hormones in the body, and in a sense, we have evolved around this hormone as it regulates light, dark cycles. There's nothing more important in our body than that hormone produced by this special little kind of royal gland in this, we call it the pineal gland that, that uh, uh, um, many ancient uh, medical people can call the, the, I think it was Descartes said it was the seat of the soul. And, um, whether that it is that or not is to be determined, but really important for many other well-documented reasons. So that's really important. So getting to bed before 10 o'clock uh, and getting the full night of melatonin is really, really critical. And meditation for pitta body types, so critical. I have a meditation called the one minute meditation that you can do, really easy to do. And we also have a whole course called uh, Transformational Awareness Technique, Six Meditations for Emotional Freedom. And there's a lot of free information there if you don't want to take the whole course, but get some of those free courses because there's, there's the understanding about meditation which I think is very profound. Many people start meditating and they stop. They don't really get the benefits. They don't stick with it. And I think there's reasons why that happens and that's why I decided to write a course about it. So you can get more information there about that. But the one minute meditation course is there for free. So you can get that and learn how to do that to start taking your mind into a, a particular place of calm, which has been shown to increase melatonin levels, balance your body, get rid of inflammation, the benefits of turning down the volume, connecting with your inner peace and calm, very, very powerful. It's sort of like a river. When you're going downstream with the river, if you've ever been in a canoe going downstream, it's very calm and peaceful. Turn the canoe and start paddling upstream. All of a sudden, the waves are slapping your canoe. It's extremely loud. Turn it around, still, absolutely quiet. Turn it up, loud. Turn it down, quiet. You want your life to be quiet and easy and calm going with the current towards the ocean? 
you got to go with the current of nature. You got to go downstream, and that's the fundamental key of Ayurveda. And really, according to many experts, the future of our health is to get reconnected. Because as we discovered the microbiome, we realized, whoa, those bugs do everything, and those bugs carry the rhythms of nature. And we need those bugs in our body to get us the rhythms. And most Americans, humans, have lost, particularly Westerners, have lost the diversity of the microbes to support the intestinal integrity and our connection to the light dark cycles. So please, um, please check out uh, the many, many articles that I've written on circadian medicine, and please check out uh, all my newsletters uh, about this topic uh, on um, melatonin. And please, if you're interested in learning more about this, don't miss out on our Ayurveda 101 course I did with Yoga Journal and Kripalu, uh, where myself and Larissa Carlson, Larissa does all the yoga and the breathing and meditation. I give you all the information about Ayurveda and lifestyle and diet and routine and exercise. They put that together in a package, packages for the winter, for the spring and the summer to guide you into optimal health uh, for years to come. Thank you for listening. I'm Dr. John Duyard. Hi, did you like this video? Do you like our content here at Life Spa? You can subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash John Duyard right here and get this valuable content every week in your inbox. This recording is brought to you by Life Spa, where ancient Ayurvedic wisdom meets modern science. Get access to free health video newsletters by Dr. John at lifespa.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease.